really hoping that that um, we share is is content that you you find personally valuable. As as we discussed, what I'd like to share with you are some perspectives based on on my observations, my experiences, uh, the the research uh, that I've been able to do, the leadership development opportunities that we've been able to do through the College of Business. Uh, that reflects my thinking about what what probably matters the most and I would like to point out a really important uh, couple of thoughts to begin first of all as, as we go through this the the more that we study leadership and this is actually in the field of leadership studies uh, a significant issue that that is discussed quite often do we really understand leadership as well as we think we do? Uh, certainly, you know, all of you that are, that are here with us today have probably read a lot on leadership. You've been through leadership development, perhaps. There's just a lot of content out there. And that, that content reflects that, that leadership, this relationship that we have between people in organizations and communities, uh, for-profit, non-profit, is a really complicated process. And what makes a good or a great leader is often a really complicated problem uh, to, to, to solve or to decipher. We're not always sure. We think we know some things that matter, but the point is that, that we're not always completely sure. So the focus of this is to focus on those things that I think we're more sure about where we have some, some better data, we have some experience that tells us, all right, of the 30 or 40 different important leadership traits that some book talks about or some website mentions, what are the ones that really matter the most? The second point we need to keep in mind is that, that leadership that works really well in one situation may not work well in another. And that points to a couple issues. One, it reminds us that leadership is complicated. Two, it reminds you that one of the most important things that you can learn to be, which is our, our final point that we'll make today, is self-aware. And being self-aware and recognizing how do I adapt my behavior to be more effective? Because what may work well with one person or one project, one area may not work in other places and you may need to adapt. Um, and that's why we focus, or, or I think self-awareness is a really important part of effective leadership. Our third, third point before we begin is that, that why people choose to follow, and follow is in quotes indicating that that's kind of a difficult word to use when we talk about leadership, but why people participate in organizations or teams or groups, do what the leader asks them to do, may not always be directed to, to directly related to leadership behavior and style. It may be just the project is really interesting. It may be that, that I'm really ambitious and I want to move up, so I'm going to work really hard independent of how my leader behaves. So why we as followers engage in our followership behaviors is often complex and hard to decipher. The last point that, that of the four points on this slide that I think is the most critical for all of you is, is what we call equifinality, meaning that there are, there are, in many cases, many possible ways to reach the same end. In other words, we talk a lot about you know, what great leadership is. And sometimes we reach a conclusion that we all have to be the same in order to be an effective leader. I certainly think, and what we will discuss today, I think there are some key foundational principles that are really important, but it doesn't mean that everyone has to behave exactly the same way. There are lots of different ways to be an effective leader. Lots of nuance, uh, I suppose, is, a, is an appropriate word there. So you don't always have to be exactly like somebody else in order to be a good leader. You can be true to who you are. Uh, as long as I think we adhere to some of, what some of those basic foundational issues are. What are those? I would like to call your attention to this, this uh, internet social uh, media acronym, in my humble opinion, and it, it, that's legitimate. That, that's not self-deprecation. Um, 
I, I do have experience. I've been doing this for quite a while. I've, I do research and leadership. I've been teaching leadership. I've, I've been lucky enough to be involved in leadership development in a number of organizations professionally over the years. But this is still one person's opinion. And there are lots of different really valid opinions about what matters in leadership. And I, so I, I do want to make clear that, that you could ask somebody else uh, in a similar position, and you might get a, a different list of five things. That's, that reflects the complexity, the difficulty of leadership. I do think, however, at least based on my experience and, and my familiar, familiarity with the field, there would be some consensus around uh, the importance of these five. They may not be in everyone's top five, but there would be consensus about, about these five being critical to the practice of leadership. Integrity, which in my mind is the single most important thing you bring to leadership roles. Uh, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the importance of communication and, and uh, why it matters so much. The third one I think is we often forget, which is that, that the leader's job is to get results. And you have to be good at what you're doing. Uh, you have to be good at the technical and the administrative and the organizational parts of your job. And that can be, that is, is, is really important over the course of your career, but perhaps most important early in your career as you're building a reputation. The fourth one, again, is one that I, I think we intuitively recognize, but we don't always appreciate how valuable and how critical it is. And that's the ability to build and maintain interpersonal networks. The final is, is what I alluded to early, uh, the importance of being self-aware. Uh, being self-reflective about your behavior, the impact of your behavior, and then engaging in steps and processes to, to improve, uh, to find better ways of, of, of uh, doing what you're asked to do and better ways of asking others to do things that need to be done. Let's, so let's just talk about each of these five. They, they are not necessarily in order of importance beyond number one. Uh, I believe very deeply that the single most important uh, uh, attribute of effective leadership long-term is integrity. And yes, I know there are exceptions, uh, which, and we'll talk about that dilemma. You know, why do some people get to positions of responsibility who uh, appear to lack integrity? And, and I recognize that dilemma. I recognize that, that uh, difficulty. But for me, I, 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 I I'm relatively convinced that it's the most important attribute that effective leaders have. And the, the simple truth is, in my opinion, without integrity, nothing of lasting value can be created. Uh, the impact of a lack of integrity in organizations, I think, is dramatic. Uh, the lack of integrity in interpersonal relationships is, is, is um, uh, devastating. And when people view you as lacking integrity, I think, I think the, the impact on your leadership ability uh, is significant. I think your ability to impact others, to persuade others, to lead others is significantly degraded when you lack integrity. Uh, you still have some power. Uh, you, you have power that comes with your role in a leadership. You, you can promote people, you can punish people, you can give people raises, you can, uh, you can do different things administratively that allow you to continue to influence uh, what others do, those who report to you. But when you've lost integrity, you've lost probably the foundation of why people really engage with work. Uh, if people cannot trust you, you are in a, a really difficult position uh, in terms of your leadership ability and your ability to, to really get things done in an organization. Let me just share some quotes that I think are critical. Uh, illustrate the point, Albert Einstein, we all know Einstein, whoever is careless with the truth in small matters cannot be trusted uh, with important matters. And I think the message of that is, is that start early in your career, no matter, no matter where you are, begin to build that reputation of, of having integrity. Uh, Marcus Aurelius, uh, if it is not right, do not do it. If it is not true, do not say it. Uh, we'll get back to this point a little bit in, in, uh, in just a moment of, um, uh, a principle that, that is, is well known actually comes from Stephen Covey's work on Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which is being loyal to the absent. 
uh, protecting the integrity, protecting the, the good name of those who are not present to defend themselves. I think uh, one of the most critical quotes, in, in fact, if, if there were uh, you know, one or two takeaways that I think would be really important for you to share uh, with, in your workplace, it's this quote from Warren Buffett. Uh, in looking for people to hire, you look for three qualities, integrity, intelligence, and energy. And I, I think he's right, absolutely right there. And if they don't have the first, the other two will kill you. Yes, we want to hire intelligent people. We want to hire people who have energy and passion for whatever they're asked to do. But if they lack integrity, intelligence and energy are really, really dangerous. We're going to allude to that a little bit uh, uh, in, in, in just a moment. But I, I really think this, this point from Buffett is, is a critical point. Integrity is the foundation. Without it, it's often really difficult to be as successful as, as, as you might like to be. And then, excuse me, <coughs> from the great uh, American journalist, Edward R. Murrow, to be persuasive in leadership is often a function of being able to persuade people, not only in that direct reporting relationship, but horizontally across the organization, as well as vertically. Uh, your ability to persuade people uh, to share information, to share insights that influence behavior and decisions is a function of your integrity. To be persuasive, we must be believable. To be believable, we must be credible. To be credible, we must be truthful. And, and I, I, that, again, I think a really important insight in how critical integrity is in this process. So what does it mean for you? Be honest with people. Whatever your role is, be honest with people. People always, almost always deserve the truth. Could we, could we debate on the universality of that, of that principle, people always deserve the truth? Probably. We could probably sit around and we could discuss exceptions to that rule. And those exceptions may be valid. Those exceptions may be reasonable. But as a general rule, in professional situations, people deserve the truth. If there's a performance issue, people deserve the truth. But at the same time, integrity is, is balanced by this, this really critical value of respecting the dignity of others. So you can always tell people the truth, but do it in a way that preserves their integrity, preserves, excuse me, preserves their dignity. And, and that, I think, is something that we can learn. Uh, being honest with people in a way that is professional, open, but respects their, their individual worth is an important part of leadership. Next point, keep your commitments really carefully and, and or make your commitments really careful, carefully, but when you, when you make them, keep them. Uh, you know, most of you here, most of you listening suffer from a fairly common problem, especially early in your career, which is to agree to do too many things. And so you take on more commitments than you possibly can, can keep. There's a very clear reason we do that is that we want to be viewed as valuable. We want to be viewed as good workers. We want to be viewed as contributors. So we often agree to do things that probably are not wise for us to do so. We may not always have a lot of flexibility. Uh, you know, saying no uh, to, to an opportunity because you think you're already too busy may be a difficult thing to do. And so we understand, you know, I understand this dilemma. But when you make a commitment, make sure that you keep the commitment or you're able to explain why you can no longer do that. Right? Uh, just a side note, I, I um, just finished reading a uh, biography of, of, of uh, Harry Truman, David McCullough's biography in, entitled Truman. If, if you're into history, if you like biographies, you haven't read it, I highly recommend it because it's full of great leadership stuff. Truman, throughout his life, and especially when he, was, when he was president, was a person of enormous integrity. And one of the great stories is when he was a senator. And he was in some ways an accidental senator. He certainly was an accidental vice president. Uh, but when he was a senator, he believed so deeply in integrity that he had made a promise to a fellow senator about supporting a certain piece of legislation. He later came to the conclusion that he could no longer do that. He went to the individual and he explained his dilemma, he explained his, his, his situation, and he asked specifically, can you please release me from this commitment that I made to you? 
And to me, that is a, an example of extraordinary integrity. Truman believed so deeply in keeping his promises that he would ask permission to break a commitment. Uh, adhere to your values. If you believe certain things are important, then keep those values. You, you have to be the model of the behavior that you expect in others. Then the point that I made just a few moments ago, we, we make judgments about the integrity uh, of people often based on how they talk about those who are absent. And if you're willing to engage in criticism and gossip, uh, that is damaging your integrity. And this is especially critical if you become a leader in that group, because now everybody knows what you used to be like. So I think one of the most important things you can do is just simply refuse to engage in criticism, gossiping, demeaning of others who are not present. Protect the good name of those who are not, who are not able to do so. Um, integrity is based on your individual performance, doing your job well. What I've tried to teach my students over the years, uh, and increasingly I think they, they need to be reminded of this, is doing the little things right in your job are, are really important, is, is really important. Because it's developing this perspective that you can be trusted. You're responsible, you have integrity, you're doing what, we're, what you're being asked to do and you're doing it well. The last of these six points is, is avoid being a destructive overachiever. All of you present are, are ambitious or you wouldn't be here. Uh, we like ambitious people. None of us would hire somebody who lacked ambition. But there's a, there's a balance between appropriate ambition and what we call destructive overachievers. Are you in this for you? Or are you in this for us? And when people perceive that you are primarily in this, whatever you're doing, for yourself, your own career growth, your own career enhancement, your own success, that damages your integrity. You can still be ambitious, but appropriately ambitious uh, without being a destructive overachiever. David McClellan, brilliant uh, uh, psychologist who did a tremendous amount of research on leadership, uh, argues that effective leaders tend to be really comfortable with power and they tend to be achievement oriented. They like to be in charge, they're comfortable with it, uh, and they like accomplishing things. And if you, if you lack those basic uh, uh, motives, it's difficult for you to, to be successful in a leadership role. Uh, so McClellan believed that wanting power was actually a very important attribute of leaders. However, he made a distinction between what he called socialized power motive and personalized power motive. Socialized power motive is you're in this for all of us. You want the group to be successful. You want the team to be successful. You recognize our contributions. Uh, you're aware of all that the, the, the rest of us are doing. You work well with us. You're still ambitious, but it's bounded. Those are the personalized power motive. It's all about, it's all about me. It's all about my goals, it's all about my career, it's all about my, my success. And they can be really destructive overachievers. So be ambitious, but be aware of not being destructively uh, overachieving, which does impact your integrity. So what does integrity do for us? It creates what we call reservoirs of goodwill. Uh, you're just a person that people can trust and, and you have these reservoirs of goodwill. Trust is a form of social capital. It's a type of currency. It's a resource that allows you and organizations to get things done. Uh, people are far more likely to forgive mistakes, missteps, errors in judgment, and so on if you, already, uh, if you have already established a reputation of integrity. You've created these reservoirs of goodwill. People are also far more likely to willingly cooperate with someone they trust. When you lose trust, when you lose integrity, you're losing a lot more than, than perhaps we recognize. You're losing this, this willingness to cooperate, which is critical to, to organizational success. What about the, ex, the, the exceptions? Yes, sometimes people, individuals who lack integrity, ascend to positions of responsibility in organizations. And all I can answer to that is selection processes and organizations are not perfect. 
and people are often rewarded for short-term results. Individual performance, individual results, and individual ability can sometimes overshadow the damage that a lack of integrity has or will cause. I acknowledge those exceptions, but I think the last point is the most valid point. We all realize it just shouldn't happen that way. Point number two of our list of five things is, is communication. And I'll start with what I think is this, these two, this most critical point. People cannot or they will not act on a message that first they do not understand or second does not create emotional engagement. Which means this, the only message that matters is the message that's received. It doesn't matter what you think you said. It doesn't matter what you're sure the memo said. It doesn't matter what you think you wrote in the email. What matters is what people understood because that's what people act on. I recognize completely that sometimes misunderstandings are the fault of the listener. I get that. We all work with people who don't listen very effectively, who don't read their emails very carefully, who aren't attentive to the details. I understand that dilemma, but I also think the point is really critical. In a leadership role or aspiring to a leadership role, you have to remember that the only message that matters is the message that people receive because that's what they understand, that's what they act on. This means in the leadership role, you have to really be attentive to developing clear, logical, and professional speaking and writing styles. Don't, don't open the opportunity for, for misunderstandings, for lack of clarity. Make sure that when you're engaging with others, make sure that when you're communicating to peers, to your direct reports, uh, to members of your team, or when you're, when you're communicating up with the organization, make sure that your style, whether it's an email, uh, a written memo, which occasionally they still, still go around, uh, a presentation, face-to-face -face conversation, phone call, make sure that, that on, for your part, that your style, is clear, it's logical, and it's professional. Something that I tell my students, and it's always good to be reminded of this, because quite frankly, at this point in their lives, uh, many of them are still tr struggling with developing really professional writing styles and understanding how critical that is. What I share with my students is, is this simple point. When anyone reads anything that you've written, or when any, anyone hears something that you've said or a presentation you've made, no matter the form of the communication, you're being judged on two factors. You're being judged on first how professional you are, how talented you are, how smart you appear to be. So emails that are sloppy, that have misspellings, presentations that are not well-crafted, we're sending a message to everyone who's hearing or reading. When anyone reads anything we've said, listens to anything, or reads something we've written, or listens to something we've said, we're being judged on two factors, how smart we appear to be, and how much we appear to have cared about the project or the presentation. We never want to leave uh, the door open for people to judge us negatively. The second point is to develop really confident, persuasive presentation skills. Be good at it, and, and that this is something that we can practice. Uh, this is something that we can simply get better at. I think an overlooked part of, of communication organizations is what we call the elevator conversation. Those short, unplanned encounters that we have in a hallway, in the elevator, on the escalator, with a coworker, with a manager, with a vice president, in which we now have two minutes or two and a half minutes to share an idea, to offer a perspective, to make an impression. Can you do that? And those are, I think, we're, we're, we're finding, and I, quite honestly, I think we've known this for a long time, those are really critical to the development of, of reputations, professional reputations. In those, those unplanned uh, situations when you can't really prepare, can you still demonstrate good communication skills, good thinking skills? Final point, final thing to be attentive to, if you're going to make a mistake, make a mistake of over-communicating rather than under-communicating. Okay? To get feedback that says, look, we know this already, you, you, you can stop telling us, that's a far less serious mistake than the opposite, which is we had no idea what you wanted us to do. This is all a surprise to us. 
you don't want to make that mistake. You can live with the over-communicating mistake. If you're going to make a mistake, make that mistake. We can't talk about communication without talking about the importance of nonverbals. Uh, I'm just going to highlight these very quickly. Uh, you know, what we call paralinguistics, tone, sarcasm, pacing. Uh, we all know how critical those can be, body language. The point is that, that the extent to which nonverbal forms of communication are consistent with the actual verbal forms. We don't want to send these mixed messages. How something is said is critical to the interpretation of what was said. And you, you, we need to recognize that. This leads to something that I'll, I'll uh, allude to in a couple of other, other points, the absolute critical nature of, of, of civil behavior and civil language. Uh, I, we have, a, 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 I think, a really significant and emerging body of, of um, research around the cost of incivility in organizations. And, and uh, leaders cannot afford to be incivil. It damages your integrity, it damages your reputation, and it impacts the ability of uh, 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 your communication ability. So be mindful of how critical that is. I think something that we often overlook in leadership roles is that one of the most powerful forms of, of behavioral communication is how you actually spend your time. What meetings you attend, what projects you work on, how you spend the course of your day, who you talk to, when you talk to them, uh, where are you in the building, those behavior choices, how you're actually spending your day is a significant form of communication. And you're communicating to people lots of different messages. The two most important are what you really care about. So the, t the way you spend your time is telling people, this is what really matters to me. It, you're also communicating information about your own level of competence. So be thoughtful, be thoughtful about your calendar. Be thoughtful about how you're actually spending your time because that is a, an overlooked form of behavioral communication and I think, a, I think the most powerful form of behavioral communication. Third on our list is, is uh, I think, you know, self-evident but, but sometimes overlooked, which is that to, to be an effective leader and especially to move up in leadership roles and, 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 and uh, opportunities, you need to demonstrate competence. The job of a leader is to get results, to serve clients, to get a product out the door, to, to uh, uh, increase sales. Whatever the responsibility is, your job as a, as a leader uh, in a leadership role, team leadership, group leadership, division, department, whatever it happens to be, is to get results. And you need to be able to demonstrate your competence. You probably don't need to be reminded of this. But in, just in case you do, you do need to be really good at your job. Uh, that, that's just, it's going to have such an impact. People are complicated. Professional relationships are really complicated. Why we like or dislike someone may also be complicated, right? Just because humans really are complicated. But of the many, many behavioral traits that explain why we have positive or negative impressions of others, why we like or dislike people. I think the research suggests that there are two that are most critical. In fact, these two probably explain upwards of 90% of the positive or negative impressions that we have of other people, why we, we like someone or dislike someone professionally. Those two are warmth and competence. Now, we're talking about competence right here and how critical that is. We're going to talk about this a little bit on point number four in building interpersonal relationship. These two, do people perceive you as warm interpersonally, as in essence a kind human being, do they perceive you as a competent person? Are you able to do your job well? Those two attributes explain upwards of 90% of the positive or negative impressions that people have of you. Let me show you a graph. Okay. Vertical axis, competence, low to high. Horizontal axis, likability, low to high. Okay. High competence, but low likability, 
we call these competent jerks. Good at their jobs, good technology, but no one wants to work with them. We actually try to avoid working with them when we can. These are the easy people. Low competence, low likability, what we call the incompetent jerks. These are the people that you probably need to, to fire, people that need to leave the organization, people that need to retire. Um, these are the challenging ones. High likability but low competence, what we call lovable fools. We prefer to work with lovable fools over competent jerks. That's not necessarily a good thing, but it illustrates how important likability is in determining the way we feel about people. Now, a quick, just a quick tangent, likability does not mean being a pushover. It does not mean that you don't make tough decisions. It does not mean that you don't hold people accountable. You have to do those things. You can be likable and tough. You can be likable and legitimately demanding. You can be likable and have high expectations of performance. You can balance those, those expectations. So being likable does not mean that you're soft or, or, or you know, not tough enough to be a leader. You let people push you around. It does not mean that. It means you respect people. This is where you really need to be. High likability, high competence. These are the people that get noticed. So you need to really focus on both. Right now we're focusing mostly on competence, but this is something we'll, we'll allude to, your ability to build relationships, which is critical. So the things to be aware of, you know, master the technical aspects of your job. Devote the time and effort to being excellent. I, I just don't think there's any, any exception to that. Uh, be good at the little things that have big impacts, especially early in your career. Professional, dependable, and reliable, meeting deadlines and expectations, and being on time. It, those little things I think have big impacts over the course of your career. I make a distinction between what, what I call the getting noticed and the moving up. Getting noticed includes kind of basic interpersonal skills. Do you get along with others? Do you communicate effectively? Uh, are you good to work with? Do you have, you know, are, are your, your specific technical and functional skills good? Can you, can you do your job well? That gets you noticed, so that allows you to build awareness. Hey, this is somebody we like, this is somebody that has potential. But to move up in an organization, we're talking about different types of competencies. Uh, this one we're going to talk about the interpersonal relationships, which are often what we call boundary spanning roles. Uh, they cross a, a, an organizational boundary department, a division boundary of some kind, or they, 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 they span the organizational boundary itself. Problem solving decision making, uh, these are the skills that really allow you to move up to upper echelons in an organization. And both are really critical in terms of your competence. So work continually to remember or to improve your thinking and analytical skills. Do you remember what Warren Buffett said, that early quote? You want people with integrity, intelligence, and energy. There are a few things that can replace just being really good at your job, being a, an important contributor. Contributing to the solving of difficult organizational problems. Find ways to do that. Those are the individuals that get additional opportunities. Those are the individuals that get highlighted or tabbed as high potential leaders, people going forward. So some suggestions, you know, read a lot, go to conferences, talk to others, create personal scenarios. Uh, you know, what would I do if, or how would I solve X? Just work on developing that ability to really contribute. Take advantage of developmental opportunities. Uh, ask for uh, you know, appropriate stretch assignments and projects. Uh, you know, be careful, uh, but, but you know, take on opportunities to grow. Think and identify current organizational issues and challenges and, and develop plans to address them. Being appropriately proactive. I had an opportunity a number of years ago to sit down with a, with a, a CEO of a major organization. Uh, somebody that I really admired, and it was a part of a project we were working on, and I asked him a question. I said, how did you learn to be a leader? What really, what really allows you to grow and develop? And that's the quote that he said. He said, I learned very early in my career when I saw a hole, I filled it. In other words, when he, solved, when he saw a problem, he found a way to solve the problem. And he, he did that professionally within the context of responsi his responsibilities. But that, I, I've never lost that impression. 
When you see a hole, fill it. When you see a problem, when you see an opportunity, be proactive. But you always have to be aware of not doing your manager's job and redesigning the jobs of other people. So there's some sophistication that you need to have here. But I, I think the advice is really sound. When you see a hole, fill it. Demonstrate your competence. Number four on our list is developing and maintaining strong interpersonal networks. What you know and what you can do is vital. But who you know and the nature of the relationships you build with others is also vital. Uh, we, we call these creating networks of mutually beneficial relationships. This is not being a suck up. This is not being a brown noser. This is not being political. This is simply recognizing that building strong relationships is really critical to your career success. With, with, with thanks to Dr. Young Mei Lui, who is a colleague of mine in the department, uh, this is content from her. I'm just gonna read it to you because I think it's really critical. In today's organizations, individuals increasingly have to collaborate with each other, and many organizations are becoming less hierarchical. That means not only do employees have to rely on others to get their goals accomplished, but they have to be able to get others' assistance without formal authority. Because of the increasing interdependence among employees and their general lack of formal authority over one another, those who have strong interpersonal networks are at an incredible advantage. Individuals who understand others' intentions and desires, influence others' thoughts and actions skillfully, and show a sense of sincerity and trustworthiness are able to motivate and inspire. And this, is, this next line is the most critical line from these two quotes. They also position themselves well in social networks and organizations, which help them quickly and accurately locate information and resources they need to get things done. Because of this, they often outperform others. And when individual intentions are not personal, but organizational gain, the entire organization benefits. Remember our earlier comment about personalized power versus socialized power motive? That's the same point. When you are skilled interpersonally and you're building these strong networks of people throughout the organization, throughout the industry, and their relationships built on trustworthiness and integrity and sincerity, you're building really productive relationships that help you get access to information resources that allow you to get things done. And when the interest is for the organization well-being, everyone wins, everyone benefits. So what this means, get involved as much as you can. Projects, cross-functional teams, committees and working groups. Make yourself available for visible projects and initiatives. Career success is not a function of performance. Career success is a function of visibility times performance. You can be a great performer, but if nobody knows it, it does little for your career success. If you're a great performer and it's visible, that's what's really going to lead to career success. And so if you have aspirations to move up, you need to think about getting yourself in visible positions appropriately. Remember, socialized power motive, not personalized power motive. Avoiding that destructive overachiever, but still getting involved. Build your credibility. Do good work. Now, again, I share with my students, good enough generally isn't in a lot of cases. You have to demonstrate integrity. Back to that key point. You have to be honest, dependable, reliable, authentic, and sincere, civil, gracious, kind, and humble. Understand and appreciate the insights, needs, and perspectives of others. Those approaches allow you to develop that warmth that we talked about earlier. Why people like you, why they trust you. When you combine your professional competence with personal warmth and likability, you're now in a position where you can have tremendous influence in an organization and really begin to build your leadership abilities. But you have to be this way. You can't fake it. You really have to be authentic in all of this. And you have to develop the ability to deal with the hard stuff, comfort with the hard stuff, dealing with, with, with conflict. Uh, having those difficult conversations when you're going to fire somebody or not promote somebody or remove somebody from a project or discuss somebody's performance uh, failures. You have to be able to do that and do it professionally, do it with respect and kindness and dignity, but still tell people the truth. Those are traits and skills that all of us can learn to do. And if you desire and aspire to leadership roles, you need to be able to develop them. 
You can't avoid them. You have to be able to say no. Listening well. Most of us listen with the intent of responding. What we're advocating here is listening with the intent of understanding and then responding. And then something that I think can be really hard for some of us, letting others have the credit and letting others shine, giving opportunities for others to have the limelight. That can be hard for us to do, but it can be really valuable to building these networks of relationships that are allowing you to be successful in your, in, in, in your roles. Two final thoughts on this point. Interpersonal trust is an incredibly valuable form of social capital. And few things will be more impactful than building a reputation based on competence, integrity, and civility. Not guaranteeing leadership success, but it's difficult to imagine being an effective leader in today's world without that reputation that comes from competence, integrity, and civility. Last one, last of our five points, uh, and then we'll open it up for some, some questions for those of you who have, have questions. Uh, it's self-awareness. And, and I, I believe my perspective is that effective leaders almost always uh, are almost always highly and appropriately self-aware. They're thoughtful about the impact that they have. Self-awareness is not debasement. It's not extreme self-deprecation. Now, a little self-deprecation self can be valuable. It really can be useful. Uh, it creates humanness. It creates closeness. It breaks down barriers. Uh, and it tells people, hey, I know that I screwed up here. Uh, I'm aware of it. Uh, too much is harmful. Uh, we like leaders that are confident. Too much self-deprecation uh, causes confidence to wane. Uh, Self-awareness is not a lack of confidence or courage. And we all know that leaders need to be courageous because they have to often make very tough decisions. Leaders need to be confident so they make decisions. I mean, back to our, our third point, which is your job is to get results. That means you have to solve problems. You have to make decisions. If you lack confidence or courage, those are going to be really difficult for you to do. Self-awareness is not a lack of confidence or courage. In fact, it's a demonstration of confidence and courage that you're able to reflect. Self-awareness is, uh, my definition is this, it's a mature judgment of the impact of our behavior on others, our individual strengths and weaknesses, and the mistakes that we have made in decision making or problem solving, along with the willingness to engage in appropriate behavior change, learning from our mistakes, and implementing corrective action. So this means my, my first suggestion is to engage in post-mortems, both the successes and failures. What was your contribution? What did you do right or wrong? What can you learn from that? What changes in your approach would you make, uh, would make a difference going forward? What development would be appropriate? Find mentors and role models, people that you admire. Learn to ask for and accept feedback. I wish we could take 20 minutes to talk about how critical this is, but you need to be, you need to be okay about asking for feedback. Build in self-reflection as a part of your day. You know, end of day reflection, what went well, what can I learn? Make notes. Uh, I recommend to people lots to keep a journal about their leadership experiences. Helps you learn, helps you be thoughtful and reflective. Set clear and measurable goals when you need to change. Individual behavior change can be awfully hard and takes time. But most importantly, accept the fact that you're not perfect. No matter how great of a leader you are, someone is not going to like you. You cannot, you cannot let that one person significantly impact the way you approach leadership. Just accept the fact that no matter how well you do, there may be somebody who just doesn't like the way you lead and just live with it. Right? A couple of things that I would like to remind you of and we'll close up here as you reflect on your leadership. People don't leave jobs, they leave managers. That's not always true. People often leave for opportunities, career changes, uh, uh, you know, spouse, spouse movements, dual career issues, but it's true enough that you need to, we need to remind ourselves. A great manager can make a miserable job and situation variable. A poor manager can ruin a great job. It, it matters a lot what you do. Last point, great leaders create the conditions in which other people want to give their best. That's my definition of leadership. It's about people wanting to cooperate and wanting to give their best and what you do as the leader to facilitate 
and to create the conditions in which those people want to get their guns. Well, we will add a video on my slide is just some additional uh, uh, resources if you want to, to, to read some additional things. And if you have comments, questions, rebuttals, corrections, that's my email. And you should feel free to get in touch with me. Um, you know, I'm, I'll, I'm like all of you, I'm stuck at home looking for stuff to do. Uh, so if you have something that you'd like to share or question, please feel free to follow up. And with that, Jamie, I uh, will turn the time back to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ringer. Um, we do have a couple questions, if, if you're okay to spend a few minutes. Um, I absolutely have questions. I very much appreciate okay. that. So um, the first one was about um, authenticity. It was, does right. authenticity fall under the integrity category? I, for me, it does. Now, not everyone would, would necessarily see it that way, and that's just one of the differences that, that people can have about what leadership is. Certainly, the authentic leader, um, and Bill George, if you're, if you're interested in, in the field, the name Bill George is the name you should search on. He's written a number of books, uh, one called True North, uh, in which he argues for this, this you know, authenticity of leadership, being really, you know, being true to your values. My perspective is, and I think it's the same as those who, who do work in this area of authenticity uh, or authentic leadership, is that it really is an aspect of integrity. It's being who you say you really are, not trying to be someone else, not trying to, to fool people into believing that you care. And that's probably the best example I can give. Uh, we, in leadership roles, we are, we are really sensitive to what people feel about it. Most of us are. There are some of us who just don't care, uh, but that's a fairly small number. But most of us care deeply about the way we're treated by those that we report to, by our managers, by our leaders. We, we care about that. We care about listening. We care about respect. We care about opportunities and growth. And if, if we feel like people aren't authentic, they're, they're, they're pretending to care because they just want to get promoted, that is, that is damaging to integrity. So yes, in, in, in my perspective, authenticity is a really important part of, of being a person of integrity. It's being true to your values. If you say, it, if you say this matters, then you, then you live that value. And it's, it's being true to what it means to be, I guess, a, a human being. That you're not, you're not creating an impression of someone that you're really not. I hope that answers the question well enough. Yeah, I think so. Um, a couple folks were asking while we're at, why we have questions going here, if you wouldn't mind returning to the slide of suggested resources so they could jot Oh, them. absolutely, of course. If I can do that without shutting this down. <laughs> that one. Ah, uh, okay, I, I did. Let me go back to that last slide. There it is. Okay, perfect. Okay, so while they're doing that, um, we also had a couple questions about um, if you're not getting credit for your achievements, um, yeah. how, how, do you, how do you gain visibility? And one specifically right. was asking about if competence and likability doesn't matter as a black female, um, if you're not being seen. So how can you gain right. visibility under those yeah. other circumstances? You, that, that, you, that, is really a tough issue. Um, you know, we, we do understand that, that you know, broadly in organizations, women probably do have a more difficult time getting noticed. And then the, the additional complexity of women of color face additional, additional uh, barriers to that. A lot of it goes back to what we call implicit theories of leadership, which are these leadership images that we carry around in our brains and the the unfortunate difficulty is that that um, in our culture and society uh, these implicit leadership theories often point to middle-aged white males as being the kind of prototypical leader manager which makes it easier for those individuals to be noticed individuals of color uh, and and women and then you know unfortunately women of color do face these difficulties. I wish I had a really straightforward, simple answer. Uh, I, I can offer some hope in that I think organizations are working to become more aware 
and more mindful of creating opportunities for for those underrepresented groups in leadership, uh, and 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 having um, growth opportunities. The best advice that I think I can give is if you have a good relationship with the person that you report to, is is having this conversation with that individual and saying, look, you know, here's my dilemma. Uh, you know. I think you think I'm doing well. I think you think I'm, I'm performing well, but I don't appear to be getting additional opportunities to grow. And I would really like those opportunities to grow. What can I do to create some of those opportunities? I understand the, the difficulty of that conversation. Uh, I, I, again, I, I, I hope that, that organizations are changing and becoming much more aware of how we create opportunities uh, and, and take advantage of the diversity across the organization. But I'm also not naive enough to, to, to know that it's not still an issue. And that there's a, there are a lot of, there's a long way organizations can go. Uh, I do think things are changing, but I think the best advice is to start small, start with your direct manager who you report to with that conversation. It may be a difficult conversation to have, and it may not be the relationship that, that promotes that type of conversation. Now, where larger organizations have interest groups and, and internal communities that are, that are designed to, to represent and promote the interests and opportunities for these underrepresented um, uh, uh, groups of, in, in leadership, then I think you get involved with those as well. And, and you use that internal networking to build, to not only create more opportunities for others, but to build and create opportunities for yourself. But I think you know, probably in my, my opinion, uh, I, I think that one-on-one -on -one conversation, what can we do collaboratively to create more opportunities? What about my performance do I need to be attentive to to create more opportunities for myself? What can I do to create more chances for me to grow? That's probably where I would start. I hope that's helpful because I, I know it's a tough issue. We, we know that it's a tough issue. Absolutely. So let's do one final question. Um, this one is, how do you manage up when people in positions of authority do not demonstrate integrity or incompetence? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I wish that weren't a problem. Uh, I, I like to think that organizations uh, tend to pro promote people who have integrity and have the best interests of the organization heart, at heart, but we know that that's not always true. Uh, managing up is really critical to building a career and, and building a reputation, but if you can't trust the people that you report to, if you can't trust them with their sharing of information, uh, I recognize that may be a dilemma that is not easily solved um, in an organization. Uh, it, it just may not, may not, not be that, that can be easily addressed. Uh, I, I think the, the two principles I would I would uh, go back to is always being a person of integrity yourself. Uh, but I would say this: if, if that relationship, uh, and, and especially if it's a direct relationship, if you're reporting to somebody who lacks integrity, that's an all that's a really difficult situation to be in. Uh, and the, the flippant response would be, you probably need to find another job. That's not always a possibility. In fact, it frequently isn't a possibility for a variety of reasons. So you just can't walk away from it. So you have to learn to manage it. One, I think, I think you, you always demonstrate integrity yourself. Uh, you take advantage of opportunities to work with others who, who are more open um, to that and are more sensitive to the importance of integrity. Never give the individual a, a reason to question your, your performance, your capability, your talent, your integrity, and always find ways to help them be successful. I, I know that sounds a little bit counterintuitive to say, you know, help someone who lacks integrity be good at his or her job, but I think that creates increased credibility and protection for, for you that you're demonstrating at all times that you're going to be good at your job, you're going to maintain the relationship, find ways to help him or her be successful uh, and never give him or her a reason to question your own integrity. Then I do think, uh, you know, absent an, an, an opportunity to share information 
A lot of organizations have mechanisms built in in terms of upper performance appraisals or, or lateral performance appraisals, horizontal 360 types of performance appraisals, where you can provide feedback about the performance of, of someone that you report to. If that's available, I think you owe it to the organization to tell the truth. This is a person who does not keep his promises. This is a person who takes advantage of, 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 of his or her staff. And I think those things have to be shared. Where those opportunities aren't available, I think it's a much more difficult situation. I think you have to protect yourself by not giving that individual any reason to doubt you. And also look for our other opportunities. You know, as, as one of the last slides we mentioned, a, a, a bad manager can ruin a great job. And, and working with or for somebody who lacks integrity makes your job really difficult. I realize, Jamie, that's not a great answer, because I don't, but I don't think there's a technique. I don't think there's a, a switch we can flip and say, okay, if you do this, you'll solve the problem. I, we can't control the behavior of other people. The only behavior that we can control is ours. I, I think one issue is, you know, focus on, you have two areas that you're worried about. One is what you can influence, one is what you're concerned about. I can't really influence my manager's lack of integrity. I'm worried about it, but I can't always influence it because I can't influence his or her behavior. What I can, what I can influence, my circle of influence is what I do, what my behavior is, how I influence the organization for good. So I think that's where you have to focus is what can I do to ensure that I'm a person of integrity, that I'm always open and honest, and that I'm protecting myself both interpersonally and professionally. As you do that, I think what happens is your ability to influence things grows to where you then can have a somewhat of an impact. But it, 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 it's a situation that there probably isn't a really simple, straightforward answer to. I wish there was, but there's not. I think we all do. Well, there, a last question, if you don't mind, Dr. Ringer, switching back to the slide with your email address. There was a few sure. people who asked about sharing of slides. Um, and Absolutely. I did and I did reply um, that they, if I would bring it up to you at the end here, if, if can they reach out to you if they're interested Absolutely. in that? Absolutely. Um, I'll send them to you as well, Jamie. So okay. if somebody approaches you, you have them. But Perfect. absolutely positively, if you want these, there's nothing proprietary. Um, I've borrowed uh, from, from, you know, what's, what's the great line about artists? Great artists steal ideas from others. Um, you know, I borrow liberally from, from lots of great thinkers in, in putting this together. And so there's nothing in here that I don't have any hesitancy in sharing at all. Wonderful. So this has also been recorded. So we will share out um, a, a link with where this will be recorded so folks can easily share that as well. Um, but I got a haircut. <laughs> We had lots of people um, saying thank you and how much they appreciate it. And on behalf of the Alumni Association, we definitely want to thank Dr. Ringer for sharing his expertise with us this afternoon. Um, but again, feel free to reach out to either myself, um, the Alumni Association, or Dr. Ringer if anybody else has any questions. With that, thank you, Dr. Ringer, and everybody have a great well, day. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.